maybe you've seen or heard about or seen some of the commercials of the campaign called He Gets Us. Some of their ads have been on TV, and then they had one at the Super Bowl where there was foot washing, if you saw that. And their website explains a little bit about the campaign. It says the campaign exists to remind us of the example that Jesus set while inviting all of us to explore his teachings so we can all follow his example of confounding an unconditional love because he gets us, all of us. And I can appreciate some of what they're trying to do, but I don't think their campaign goes far enough because we need more than God's empathy. We need God's salvation. Certainly we need to know that God cares about us and understands us, but we need God himself and we need God's salvation. And I thought of that because in the letter to Titus, Paul makes two bold statements about how God relates to us And it goes way beyond empathy. They're found as summary statements in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and and also Titus 3. Here's the one from Titus 2. He, that is Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his very own who are zealous for good deeds. Then in Titus 3, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. This first statement that I mentioned is in Titus 2, 11 through 14, and I'm going to read that here in a moment. But I want to share a little bit of the context of the letter so we can understand where Paul's coming from. He is writing to Titus, who is in Crete. And Crete is one of those places or churches where the district superintendent, who in the Church of the Nazarene uh, is the one who helps churches find a pastor, where the district superintendent might say, this is a wonderful opportunity. Tongue in cheek. Wayne understands. Pastor Wayne understands what I'm talking about. It is a place that you wouldn't want to go to minister, probably, if you knew about what was happening. <coughs> In fact, Paul quotes from Crete's one of their very own prophets to describe this, the people there and the situation there. Titus 1, 12-13. One of their own people says this about the Cretans. Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, and lazy gluttons. Sounds like a great place to go minister to, right? Sounds like a great place to, to, to go and, and preach the gospel. And Paul says, that testimony is true. That testimony is true. Now there were some Cretans in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and perhaps that's how the church spread there. But this culture that Titus is in, <clears throat> and the church there is fraught with problems. And, and what's even further, you know, kind of amazing, is that Paul doesn't seem to give Titus a choice as to whether or not he stays there in Crete to minister. Because Titus 1.5 says that Paul leaves him behind in Crete. <laughs> he leaves him behind. Boy, thanks a lot. Right? He leaves him behind. Part of uh, 2 Corinthians 7 might give us some understanding of why Paul would do this. He trusts Titus for difficult circumstances. In 2 Corinthians, he has sent Titus to go smooth things out for for he and the church in Corinth. And and he brings back good news that consoles Paul. (coughs) And that church is the takes the cake of all churches in terms of problems. So for Titus to handle that so well is likely the reason, or at least part of it, why Paul leaves Titus behind in Crete. He trusts that Titus will be able to do the job. And Paul doesn't leave him without anything to go on either. He doesn't say, well, good luck, buddy, you'll need it. Hurry, let's get out of here before he wants me to stay. You know, he doesn't do that at all. No, he gives him instructions in the first couple of chapters. And he tells them, you need to appoint elders in every town. 
You need to put things in order here. You need to put people in leadership so that there's, there's people they can look to and count on. And he further instructs them, uh, Titus, to deal with those who are teaching for sordid gain or who are teaching what is not right by doing the opposite, by preaching sound doctrine. That's one of the concerns in the book of Titus. And Paul gives other instructions in Titus, but the summary statements of sound doctrine in Titus, as some call them, in Titus 2, 11 through 14 and 3, 4 through 8, suggests the importance and the potency of having a firm grasp on the word for this difficult assignment. <coughs> Yet Paul's not only concerned that sound doctrine is set forth, he wants to see it lived out in the lives of the people. He wants to see the knowledge of the truth lead to upright and godly lives. Because there are people there in Crete who profess they know God, but they deny Him by their actions. And he's warning Timothy, excuse me, Titus, and the church there in Crete, <coughs> I don't want that to be able to be said about you. We find our text in Titus 2, 11 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The word of the Lord. So Paul begins this letter to Titus, giving him his assignment, telling him why he left him behind. But also, if you turn back to chapter 1, I want you to notice that he also reminds Titus of God's faithfulness. While all the Cretans are liars, God is not a liar, he says. In fact, God <coughs> never lies, and He promised the hope of eternal life before the ages began. And the hope of that salvation, now in our text, he says and announces, has appeared in Jesus Christ. The grace of God has appeared, that hope of eternal salvation. The hope of eternal life has now appeared in Jesus Christ. It's been brought to us by the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Now, that's why Wesleyans, by the way, don't believe the Scriptures teach a limited atonement, that Jesus just by, uh, died for predestined select few. But He died so it would be made available to all, not that everyone will be saved, but that Christ's death and resurrection has been made available to all by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 14, because this is one of the statements that Paul makes throughout his letters that is the theme for this sermon series during this season of Lent, and I have it up on the screen as well. Look at verse 14. It explains <coughs> how salvation was brought to us. He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity. <laughs> he gave Himself for us. It recalls Isaiah 53.12. He poured Himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet He bore the sin of men and He made intercession for the transgressors. This is what Christ did for us. This is His intercessory work in our place and on our behalf. He did this for us. You know, during Advent and Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. During this season and these passages that we're going to look at will invite us to recall and celebrate that God is for us. God is with us and God is for us. And how do we know that? Because He didn't withhold His own Son. How do we know that? Because Jesus Himself gave Himself up for us. He's for us. To redeem us. 
And it's not something we could do for ourselves. We couldn't forgive our own iniquities, our own sin. We couldn't redeem ourselves. God instead took the gracious initiative and acted on behalf, bringing salvation to us. That's that's uh, what we're saying this morning, isn't it? Jesus Messiah, the rescue for sinners. That's who he is. He is for us. And how did that happen? He gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. That's how we know. In fact, that's how we know what grace and mercy and love even are because of what Christ has done for us. Tom Long put it this way, saving grace is not just an idea or a sweet sentiment. God didn't merely arrange the clouds to spell I love you. He sent the Son to prove His love for us. And Jesus gave Himself up for us. That's how we know that God is for us. He says He brought and through His own body brought salvation for all. So God for us isn't an abstract or academic concept. You know, what do we do this morning? We sing songs that show how that love and how God is for us is so concrete in the personal work of Jesus Christ. Jesus to Calvary did go. That's how we know God is for us. That happened. His love for sinners to show. That's how we know God is for us. What he did there brought hope from despair. Those words are so good, aren't they? This is my favorite line of the song. He gave his life, what more could he give? God is for us. So God for us isn't abstract. No, it's concrete. In the person and work of Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us, that's how we know. The cross, if we were to say, how do we know that God is for us? We look to the cross. What he's done for us. It proves, Paul says, it demonstrates the love of God for us. In the same way, we sell, when we celebrate communion, which is a celebration and thanksgiving and participation in the sacrifice, it's also a concrete experience. Have you ever noticed that? It's a concrete experience. We hear the words of institution. Jesus says, this is my body which is broken for you. We are reminded of those words, but we also touch and taste and even smell. All the senses are involved as we take in what Jesus has done for us. It declares that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us. And as John 10 read this morning indicate, Jesus did this willingly. He gave himself up for us, but it wasn't because the Father was making him do it. Jesus said, yes, Father, your will be done, not mine. He he did it not because somebody took his life. No, he willingly laid down his life, John says. John 10 says, Jesus says that. No one took my life, Jesus says. I laid it down of my own accord. He willingly gave himself up for us. Willingly. Now, this isn't the end of the sermon. hate to disappoint you, but I I thought it poignant that we would celebrate communion now since I've just been talking about that. I don't want you to lose that in your hearts and minds. So I thought, well, why not just celebrate communion in the middle of the sermon or a little further than the middle even Uh, and, and to put that in action. So this morning... The elements of the sacrament of communion are going to be brought to you to symbolize God's initiative towards us. Or as verse 11 says, verse 11 puts it, the grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all people. So I'm going to serve the sacrament of communion, bringing it to you this morning. If you would hold on to the elements until everyone's been served, Jesus gave himself up for us to redeem us. And Paul adds to also purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. Uh, Wesley talks about it this way. That means God is at work in us. God is for us and he is at work in us, as Paul says in Philippians 2.13, enabling us to will and to work for his good pleasure. He's at work in us. This is his sanctifying grace and work in our lives. 
You see, to profess to know God also means to turn away from and repent from godless living and worldly passions, lest we deny Him by our actions. That's what He says there at the end of chapter 2. Chapter 1, excuse me. In other words, knowledge of the truth should lead to godliness because God in His grace begins a good, a great uh, education process in our lives. A training process, the text says. The grace of God begins to teach us or train us what it looks like to live the life He's called us to. Or in the words of verse 12, self-controlled and right living. God begins to purify our hearts and He begins to educate us and train us in those kind of ways. In fact, it's the same word used of training children when they're young. It's used in Acts chapter 7, verse 22 of Stephen who talks about Moses, how he as a child was in Egypt and he didn't know any of those ways or wisdoms, uh, wisdom of Egypt, so he had to learn all of that. And in the same way, as a, a believer is, as a person is redeemed, they, they have to learn a different way of life, a different course than the one that they've been on before they were redeemed. And each of us is at a different point in our grace education. But each of us is invited to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in that grace training wherever we're at in that walk with Him. And the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit will do, will give us the impulse to grow, the impulse to look into God's Word more and more. It might be uh, lots of different ways, but the impulse to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It might be the impulse to put the phone down or turn the TV off and spend some time in His Word. It might be the impulse to think about that person that needs our forgiveness. It might be dealing with that sin that keeps entangling us and causing havoc in our relationships. It might mean to relinquish a certain area in our lives that we keep trying to hold on to and keep control of, and He's asking us to relinquish it to Him. He gives us all these impulses, these leadings of His Spirit, and unless we act on those impro- uh, in, impulses, those leadings in the strength that He provides, unless we walk in the light that He gives us, we will stunt His grace education in our lives. Just as a student, if they go to a class in, in elementary school or middle school or high school or college or whatever, and they just sit there in the class but don't listen to anything that's being said, if they're not putting into practice the homework and all that, they're not going to learn anything. It's going to go in one ear and out the other. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives, He's inviting us to keep in step with Him and to learn what He's wanting to teach us. In 1 Timothy 4.8, Paul puts this cooperation this way. Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, godliness is valuable in every way. Now, that's not an excuse to not do any physical training. But he's pointing out that, that there is value in training ourselves in godliness. He says, holding promise for this present life and the life to come. This grace education and training then is ongoing in our Christian lives and is meant to help us live upright and godly lives in this present age, verse 12. And there are going to be growth spurts in our Christian lives. There's going to be seasons when we, when we just notice how God is really helping us and shaping us and changing us and transforming us. And there'll be other times when it doesn't seem like much is happening. But there are also no shortcuts to make something happen. That's what one man in England try to do with physical training and since Paul mentions that I thought I'd use this as an example Dean Gunther is a tattoo artist currently residing in Manchester England and one of his friends didn't want to do he didn't want to work out he hated physical training he hated going to the gym so he asked his friend who's a tattoo artist to tattoo on his stomach a six pack, six pack of abs on his stomach so it would look like he had been working out which I think is a stupid idea, but this guy was excited about it. He, he, he said, I'm going to even do it for free. He said, I'm an expert in color realism, so I'm going to do the best I can for you. And it took two days, and this man has tattooed abs on his stomach, and from a distance it looks pretty good, apparently. The thing is, it's not real. 
It's not real. It's not. And what happens when he gains a little bit of weight like I have? That's going to look ridiculous to have that on his stomach. You see, so substituting outward appearance for real transformation doesn't work. Physical training wise, but also in our Christian lives. Substituting outward appearance for real transformation doesn't work. But the good news is the Holy Spirit is working in us and is transforming us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, from one degree of glory to another. And this is from the Lord, the Spirit. He's doing this work in us and he's asking us to cooperate with him and keep in step with him and obey him and listen to him and allow him to bring about in our lives more and more the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. He is doing that work in us. And this is what Paul wants for the church in Crete and for us. See, as much as Paul is concerned about sound doctrine, he wants their lives to reflect that faithful teaching and preaching as well. To live lives worthy of the calling, Ephesians 4, 1 puts it. So while the Cretans are known to be liars, vicious brutes, and lazy gluttons, the good news is that Christ gave himself up for them too. That they could be redeemed and purified as his very own people. This isn't about earning salvation in any way. Paul makes that clear in Titus 3 5. He saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we'd done, but according to his mercy through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. But as a result of redemption, we're saved into a new life. Verse 14 says this includes being zealous for good deeds. Look at Titus 3.14. He adds there, and let people learn to devote themselves to good works in order to meet urgent needs so that they might not be unproductive. Ephesians 2.8-10 explain the relationship between good works and salvation. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But then he goes on to say this, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, what? To do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. So we aren't saved by good works, but we are saved to a life of good works for the glory of his name. And Paul has this hope, even for the Cretans, these liars, these, these gluttons, these brute, <coughs> brutes. He has this hope for him, or he wouldn't have even bothered to leave Timothy. But the basis of his hope, obviously then, isn't founded on what the Cretans are known for, but on God's faithfulness and on what's announced here that Jesus Christ has given himself up for us to redeem us and to purify us as his very own people. And that's our hope for this community as well that we're located in and minister in. And that's how I'm going to invite us to pray during this sermon series. This goes along with actually the 2024 emphasis in USA Canada region called Blessing Our Community. I've given it in your bulletin. This is something that Dr. Estep shared with the pastors at the prayer retreat. I think he shared it at Equip KC yesterday as well. But this is an invitation to be in prayer for our community so that our lives would reflect our relationship with the Lord. And it would invite us to think about <coughs> how to bless our community. And there's some personal questions that begin to get us thinking about that. And then some ways at the bottom there to pray to bless those in our community as well as a way to, to uh, pray for them, but to bless them as well. And to be, be his people in the community. That's what Paul's after here. Not just, yeah, I believe all the right things, but do our lives reflected by the grace of God? Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that you don't give up on the work you've started. Uh, the work you started in us, you're going to bring to completion by the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you that you don't, you don't, uh, just throw in the towel so quickly as, as we, as we uh, 
don't grow or don't follow after you in the ways that you would like us to. Thank you that you're so patient with us. Thank you that you want to continue to teach us and to train us in your ways, and we want to be your people. But we give you thanks this morning that you don't just get us, but that you that you redeemed us, you gave yourself for us, and that you not only gave yourself for us to redeem us, but to give us a new life, new life in Christ Jesus, and to set us apart as your people in the world. And we're grateful for that. And we ask that you would give us an openness to how you're at work in our lives and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.